All right. That's it, and we're live. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm John Cavalier from Cavalier House Books, and uh, thanks for tuning in on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, or wherever you're finding us today. We really appreciate it. I am joined today with uh, photographer David Frazee, who has this monster new book out. So big, I've got to scoot back a little bit to get it all in frame. Right. Um, Mississippi River, Headwaters and Heartland to Delta and Gulf. And David, thank you so much for taking some time with us. Well, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, John. I'm always glad to uh, come on and talk about the images and uh, how it all started and what's next. And, uh, and of course, any questions people have, I'm more than happy to answer uh, from technical to logistical to uh, how do you get a book done and, sure. and all that stuff. So I'm open to anything. Well, that's that's what I find. Um, that's what I found really interesting. Uh, so I was I've spent um, the past couple of days with your book and just kind of pouring over the images and um, reading all the little details that you put in um, the back, all the little notes and everything. And um, my favorite, and I think it kind of sums up the entirety of the book. You had one image at, at the confluence of the Mississippi Missouri rivers. And you wrote, I left a pair of shoes and socks stuck in the big muddy of the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, right. uh, thus assuring myself uh, an imperceptible foothold in the river's history. That's and I thought, that, <laughs> I thought that summed it all up from the logistical, from the technical, to That's the artist. You know, talk about being stuck in the mud. I really <laughs> was. And uh, yeah, I was trying to, there's a promontory. I, too bad I can't bring that photograph up. But uh, it's it's right at the confluence, and you can walk out, and there's a concrete uh, tabletop almost that's out there that you can kind of gently get out to if you're lucky. So I went out to it on the side of the where the there were rocks, and I could walk on these rocks because I tested the mud, and it looked it was I was you'd sink, you know. So I got all the way out there, and. Uh, I ended up, it's funny because I ended up using a different shot, so it was all for naught. But then on the way back, I thought, oh, you know, that mud, that mud looks pretty solid over on the other side going back. So I took one step off and I went right up to my knees. <laughs> and uh, at first, you know, you're a little worried, you know, is it is it going to be quicksand or am I going to be able to get out? Well, that lasted for a, mic, you know, a millisecond. And then I realized, well, I know I can get out but am I gonna get out with my shoes and socks? And so as I pulled <laughs> one leg out, the shoes and socks just stayed in there. Then I said, oh, well, the hell with it, just pulled out the other one and then managed to get back. And my wife was uh, laughing and you know, took a picture of me all muddied up. And uh, then I, I, we had some drinking water that I used to rinse the mud off and uh, it was a bit of a mess, but it was worth it, it was fun. We laugh, something you laugh about later. Yeah, I mean, it was a great shot. So, I mean, it was yeah. definitely worth a pair of shoes, I think. So. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, it's great. Just leave something behind. Right, right. And so um, so this is actually uh, the third book in a trilogy. Right. Um, where um, the first book, you went out to the West Coast. The second book, um, you did the East Coast. And now you're coming straight down the middle of the country with the Mississippi River. So tell us right. a little bit about your other two books and tell us a little bit about how they all kind of fit together. Sure. And in fact, let me, let me bring them up now. Uh, yeah. I'll bring up here the show as well as my mouse is working. I've got to get it. What's going on here? What happened? Oh, here I have one of these things where my yeah uh, yeah we've got it up on the uh, the on the stream yard. It, it's, oh wait, it's I wrong, yeah. what's going on? All of a sudden, my mount. Can, are you, did you? Am I? Is that changing? Uh, yeah, right now. Yeah, you've got the uh, Mississippi River book up. I'm not sure what's going on here. There you go. Uh, do you have it full screen? Are you seeing it full screen? Yeah, we have we we've got it up full. Okay, uh, looks good. All right, good because I, I I can use my arrows to move it. Yeah, I'm toggle seeing back. something completely different than you're seeing, but as long as I oh I, I got can, you, I can pretty well see what's going on. 
All right, yeah, so these are the first two books, uh, East Coast, Arctic to Tropic, which is on the left, West Coast, Bering to Baja, which is on the right. And West Coast was the first book. And I guess the natural question would be, well, did you know you were going to do three books? And hell no, I didn't know I was going to do three books. You're, you're lucky enough uh, if I could get one done. Um, photographers, I mean, that's the ultimate goal. It's like if you're in the film industry, you want to do a feature film. And if you're in photography, you want to get a photo book because it's a great legacy for your work. And it it's something that lasts, it ends up in libraries and if you're fortunate like I've been, some of the museums will uh, acquire prints and you get work into the collections. But I can tell you straight off the bat, you do not make money off of a photography book. Um, in fact, you usually lose money um, mm. because you are you have to raise money. Uh, sometimes you use some of your own, but you need donors and corporations and uh, I did Indiegogo campaigns, and you know when you're always asking for money, it's quite tiresome and it's uh, it's difficult. So fortunately, we had some donors uh, through the publisher, and we got West Coast pretty well off the ground fairly quickly. Uh, and this book was basically about the geology of the West Coast. So most of the photographs are as what we call scenic photographs, I guess, in the Ansel Adams or Sierra Club tradition, although I hesitate to use that, but that's what a lot of people like to pigeonhole it as. Mm -hmm. um, but what, and then I, I wanted to get a writer. I wanted to get, uh, I ended up getting Simon Winchester, for those of you who know who Simon is. He's a pretty highly regarded best-selling author who as probably the book you might know the most has nothing to do with geology was the professor and the madman which he wrote right. 20 years ago as a million seller and fascinating story of the oxford english dictionary which you would think oh, you know that doesn't sound too interesting but it's fascinating so he did very well with that and then he's his degree is in geology from oxford university and he's always had a love of geology and i knew about him and i i well i wrote him a letter and asked him if he would consider writing a foreword for West Coast. And much to my pleasant surprise, he agreed. And we've since become really good friends. And he's now written the, the uh, foreword, or not the foreword, the, the main text. He's written the main text for all three books. Um, so anyway, we got that off the ground and I was even happy. Um, as I said, most of the uh, images on the West Coast, you're, you associate the West Coast with beautiful scenery and you can see the rocks there on the cover of West Coast and the Big Sur area and the coast of Oregon, Crater Lake, and it's just incredibly beautiful. But as Simon points out, all that beautiful scenery, uh, where there's beauty, there's danger. Because all that beautiful scenery is created by powerful geological forces. And that's why the coast of California is quite dangerous. We all know about the San Andreas Fault, and then that's that's dwarfed by the Cascadia Fault that runs through Oregon and Washington. If that fault goes, it's going to be in big trouble. And then, of course, we've when I was out there uh, from the late 1990s um, into the 2000, I finished the photography in 2010. There were no fires like we see out there now. Uh, and that has since become a, a quite in, uh, a problematic for uh, the whole West Coast, from uh, Washington to Oregon and into California. So that's uh, an additional danger that's created. So the West Coast is kind of dangerous because of geological forces and climate change, of course, which is creating the the uh, the dry conditions, and the it's just ripe for these fires. So anyway, when the book was done, I thought, oh, that's great. I, I got my dream. I got a, my first photo book done. No thoughts of doing another one because you're exhausted by the time that <laughs> you raise the money and you get it all done and you oversee everything. So someone jokingly said, well, I think you'll do what, East Coast next. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I don't think there's going to be the scenery is certainly not as uh, um, stunning and you know it's, it's it's pretty flat it's a settled geology and then hurricane sandy hit new york city 
and that was in 2012, just that soon after the West Coast book came out. And I thought, oh, well, now there's the reason to do the East Coast hmm. because the East Coast is, everything is pretty low lying, at least on the coast of the United States. And in fact, the land is sinking in some areas and the sea level is rising. So I, I took it upon myself to do all the major East Coast cities. And I also started up in the Arctic. It's Arctic to Tropic. I started in Greenland and Baffin Island in uh, Canada, down through Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, and then into Maine and, and down to the Keys, the Florida Keys. So it's pretty extensive and you can see the ice melting. So you get that uh, connection of the melting ice up in Greenland. And then it, as you proceed down uh, into the United States, you see the low, the low uh, uh, beaches that are subject to erosion. And here at the Jersey Shore, they have to keep pumping sand in every year. And at some point, you just can't keep up with it. Um, there's some beaches down in you know, South Carolina where that has happened, where it's just that the land is slowly, slowly being taken over. There's an island that's been inundated in Chesapeake Bay. So and I, I got up in the air to photograph uh, the East Coast, especially because that way you could put the uh, cities of the East Coast into an environmental context with the sea. All right, so we had to raise a lot more money. The books keep getting bigger. Uh, it was double the price, um, so I had to really go to the well. Very happy, you know, but it was exhausting. So, you know, I thought, well, that's it for a while. <laughs> then Transamerica Corporation, the insurance company, had donated some money to do the East Coast book. And they said to me, uh, you know, if you're interested in doing a book on the Mississippi River, you know, we have an office in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which is pretty near the river. And, uh, you know, we might consider getting behind that. So I thought, oh, that would be great because I have the two coasts. I'd love to get the middle of the country. And some people call the Mississippi River the third coast. So I wrote, I wrote them a proposal and they ended up funding the whole book. Wow. which is yeah, everything. And that I works. actually finally made some money, or I should, that's, uh, I use that term loosely. At least all my expenses got reimbursed right. for travel and so on and so forth. So that's how the Mississippi River book uh, came about. And so that we see that right here. And then this is the trilogy. So I ended up, uh, I didn't plan, you know, when I started this, I didn't say, oh, you know, I'm gonna do a trilogy on North American waters, because Canada is in is in um, West Coast and East Coast. Mexico is in the West Coast book. The Mississippi River, that's the only book where everything is within the confines of the US, even though Canadian uh, uh, waters do drain into the Mississippi. Yeah. And yeah, you mentioned um, uh, Simon Winchester's essay that he wrote uh, for Mississippi River. and. Right. Uh, reading through it, um, the really great thing is, you know, in your book, you go from the very top all the way to the mouth of the Mississippi River. And he kind of right. takes you through that um, in his essay as well. Right. And um, I didn't realize uh, about his background in geology, but um, I definitely want to reread some of that now, knowing that because yeah. he, he threw in so many little tidbits yes. you know, that I never knew. And uh, some of his other books, like Krakatoa, which was about the volcanic eruption in the late 1800s of, in Indonesia, which had a huge effect on the climate, well, the, the weather patterns for the next few years, because so much ash was uh, thrown up into the air. And he did another book uh, called A Crack in the Edge of the World, which was about the uh, San Francisco earthquake in 1906. And another book about geology is called The Map That Changed the World, which was about the first map that showed the uh, layers of sediment that have, we've become so indicative of geological time frames as they look at the strata within the rock. And that all of this is fairly recent. You know, the, and the theory of tectonic plates only goes back to the 1960s. So all of these advances in geology are, are 
re relatively recent in, in the scheme of things. Right. And uh, yeah, I watched yeah. a couple of um, videos that um, uh, you and Simon Winchester had right. done. Uh, I saw a couple online and um, you were talking about sort of thematically, and you touched on it a little bit when speaking about the three books as a trilogy of kind of going from the expansiveness of the West and the beauty of it to focusing on the cities and how there's uh, more of an urgency with the relationship that people have with the bodies of water that they live near. Right. Right. And I thought, you know, with the Mississippi river book that you kind of get the, get both of those worlds because as you literally travel down the river, you go from, these beautiful shots of this absolutely gorgeous, uh, you know, these gorgeous frozen lakes and, you know, um, uh, gorgeous landscapes to you get into talking a little bit about eroding infrastructure and the dams that have mm -hmm. gone past their life expectancy and coming on down to our neck of the woods where, you know, um, uh, the stretch of the Mississippi River down here is affectionately called the Cancer Alley. And so yeah, it's right. Um, you know, uh, I thought that was a perfect mix. And so, yeah, definitely. I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about that as well. That sort of that urgency that you could definitely see in your photography. Yeah. Of yeah. Let's the interplay. Let's uh, start. I have uh, yeah. I don't know, like 40 slides and then and we're sure. gonna, it's an abbreviated. I think the book has 208 images. So I've abbreviated it considerably, but we're still going to go north to south. Yeah, and, let's take a trip. Uh, so let's uh, let's get rolling. So yeah, I, I did want to start, even though Minnesota is, it's not snow covered all the time, but I wanted to, because the other two books, I did start in snow and ice. Uh, for the West Coast book, I got out to the Aleutian Islands, which is incredibly beautiful. Um, and those are all volcanoes. So here with the Mississippi River, this is the source of the river. And if you look to the left, the far left of the frame, you'll see that white uh, ice covered lake, that's Lake Itasca. And that's the source of the Mississippi. And you can see it snakes out of there. And what we're looking at here is about the first mile of the river. And it's only about 20 feet across for quite some time. Um, and I should also add that Simon Winchester points out in his wonderful text, which is a one of the best short histories of the river you could ever read. That Lake Atasca is a completely manufactured beginning of the river. The Army Corps of Engineers thought the river should have a glorious start to it. So they dammed it and there's concrete underneath, which you'll never see. And they made it quite picturesque so that it starts quite nicely as a stream as it goes on its way. If it were up to nature, it wouldn't look quite like that. <laughs> so here we are. Um, this is about 20 miles uh, from the source of the river. Again, we're st obviously still in winter and we're on a highway bridge. This is how I got myself into the only time I ever got myself into a shot, at least my shadow anyway, kind of an Alfred Hitchcock uh, attempt at getting, in getting into a, an image. But you can see the, the river here is froze. And you can't even call it a river, really. It's a stream. It's only about 20 feet across. And you can easily walk across it, wade across it. Another thing that a lot of people may not know, unless you live in Minnesota, is that the Mississippi River goes through a series of four lakes. As it, uh, as it comes out of Lake Itasca, it actually has north. And when it gets into this lake, which is called Lake Bemidji, which is right outside of Bemidji, Minnesota, it goes through the lake. And here you see it's exiting Lake Bemidji. And it then will proceed through a series of uh, three more lakes as it heads east, due east. Then it gets to uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota. And then it takes its first turn south. And it goes a little southwest. And then once it gets to uh, Minneapolis Southwest, then it goes southeast a little bit. And by then it hits Minneapolis. And then it's pretty well almost straight south to the Gulf of uh, Mexico. 
so here's the river again. It's still it's not it's not the great mighty river that we think of at this point. This is uh, still up in northern Minnesota. <clears throat> then we get to a town called Little Falls, and here you see a this is a hydroelectric dam. It produces a very low megawatt, I think four megawatts, just barely enough to uh, run uh, most of the, the uh, electricity in the town. But uh, on the left, obviously, you see it in the winter, and then on the right, the same dam in the fall. Because the river does com pretty well completely freeze over in the winter, certainly from Minnesota, uh, pretty much through Iowa, oftentimes as far as St. Louis, if it's a really cold winter. Uh, now, here we are in Minneapolis. Now, all across, all along the river, as Simon uh, Winchester points out in his text, the Mississippi River is, is basically a manufactured river. There's very little natural left anymore. Um, and in many areas, it's become a canal, <clears throat> quite frankly, as it gets especially south of Memphis when the levees start to appear. So this is in, but this is in Minneapolis. And if you look to the center right, you see that bit of white water there. <clears throat> this is the only natural waterfall on the river. But again, it's been dammed over. You wouldn't know it uh, because it's all covered with concrete. And you just see that little bit of fall that's still there. And the river was dammed over there. And there were paper mills all along the river here, furniture uh, manufacturing places, flour mills. And the water was used to power the industry in, in the early days. Yeah, for me, especially seeing uh, the northern parts of the river that I'm, I'm you know, obviously unfamiliar with, um, you know, down here, you kind of take the levees for granted. You know, they've right. been there. You know, they've been there my entire life. You know, they were certainly there, yeah. you know, my parents entire my parents' entire life, you know. Um right. the control structures, et cetera. And so seeing um seeing uh the different landscape and seeing the beginning of it, you know, it's 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 a lot more evident that, you know, those are all choices that people made, you mm -hmm. know. Um and those choices um, you know, they can result in, you know, the th a city thriving or they could also have bad consequences as well and so that's one of the things that sort of struck me with um going north to south as we're doing absolutely mm -hmm. uh, and you know we'll get into you'll see the crops will change as you go north to south uh <clears throat> the first levees and uh, what well, we'll get we'll get to that as we proceed uh, here is one of the first dams so the lock and dam system on the river uh, goes from uh, just south of Minneapolis to uh, St. Louis, and that's the last lock and dam. So it's all the northern part of the river. And the scenery in the northern part of the river, especially in Minnesota, Wisconsin, is quite extraordinary. Because if you go back to the last ice age, the, that sheet of ice that came down over Canada didn't quite make it to this area where the river is. But when the water started melting, it melted very quickly and there were great gushes of water. And that created the bluffs that are evident, 500 foot high bluffs. You can see them to the right in this photograph uh, all along the river. And then the river drops, these locks and dams account for about a 500 foot drop in the river between uh, Minnesota down to St. Louis. Hmm. Ah, the American Eagle, of course. So I, one of the things with this book, uh, I did a lot of research before I even took a camera with me and, or started to plan anything. And a lot of research online. I read a, six, seven books. Um, and as much as you plan, you're always going to find surprises. So as we were driving through Minnesota, this is in uh, uh, Wabasha, Wabasha uh, Minnesota. Now, my wife, who accompanied me on uh, a lot of these uh, uh, road trips, 
she's used to this. So we see a sign for the American Eagle Center. And I, I get about 100 feet past and I go, oh my, you know, slam on the brakes, <laughs> do the U-turn, go flying back. And so people have to get used to that if you're traveling with a photographer by car. <clears throat> and I'm so glad we went there because there's this National Eagle Center where they take care of uh, injured uh, bald eagles and golden eagles. Those are the two main birds. And it's an education center and a uh, place where injured birds are given a home. They're not cared for there. Uh, I should say they're not, they're not uh, rehabbed there. That generally takes place somewhere else. And then after the bird is rehabbed, it'll go to the Eagle Center. So uh, I didn't have time to set up a shot when we were there in the summer, but I knew I wanted to go back in the winter because I wanted to get shots of eagles. And why eagles? Well, eagles are very, well, first of all, it's the national symbol. Secondly, it's very important in Native American culture, uh, has been uh, an important uh, bird of prey to them for as long as you can trace back Indian culture. And there are eagle festivals all up and down the river, and you can find bald eagles all the way down into the Atchafalaya Basin, where I actually took some shots of other eagles. Um, so I wanted to get that bird in. And uh, this shot, it, uh, so I made arrangements. I went up in the winter to photograph them. I also got shots of birds, uh, eagles uh, in, in the wild. I was very fortunate to get. And uh, this uh, man, is his, this gentleman's name is Al Cooper, and he's been caring for this bird whose name is Angel, for well, ever since Angel was brought to the rescue center. And uh, what I loved about this shot now, especially, is you have an African American man who is looking eye to eye with the American symbol of the bald eagle, and I think that makes for a very powerful photograph in in this day and age. And I was, kind of took on that meaning, but when I took the shot, that that meaning hadn't clicked in. But over the last year, especially, it's really clicked in. And so it's, it shows yeah. how, how um, photographs can take on a meaning depending on what's going on at the time. Yeah, and you can definitely see how it, it takes a confidence to stand there and, and, yeah. and look eye to eye with that eagle. And I so, yeah, it. it's it's definitely powerful. <laughs> it's like eye to eye, you know. And uh, of course, <clears throat> there are the railroads, especially in the, uh, from St. Louis on up. Uh, not so much once it gets to the south, and the railroads are a little farther off the river. But in this area, the railroad tracks run right alongside the river, and they, they are very frequent. Every 15 minutes, 20 minutes, there'll be a freight train coming through. So besides the barge traffic that goes along the river, which is the cheapest way to uh, trans transport goods and commodities, the railroads still do a, a Herculean job as well, up, all up and down the river. Here are the bluffs I was uh, alluding to before, and th these were created again by the great melt uh, of the glaciers from the last ice age, as that water just poured out as these glaciers melted and created these valleys that you see. And then down below the highway, <coughs> which I think it's number 63 or 61 in uh, Minnesota, uh, it's, it's considered part of the Great River Road. Now, as an East Coast person, before I started this project, I didn't know a lot about the Mississippi River. I knew about the barge traffic. Um, I knew about the trains. I knew some of the, the history, of course, um, but I didn't know that you could actually drive the river on either side, either the west side or the east side of the river. Mm -hmm. And the Great River Road is, it's not one road that was created like, uh, you know, like the interstate highway system. It's an amalgam of, of highways, streets, roads. Uh, some of the roads are very small that go through towns, but it's all part of the Great River Road. And you can buy a map that will guide you if you want to stay on that road. Sometimes it goes pretty far away from the river. But a lot of the times it's right next to it, as you see here. Yeah, down here with um, the river roads that run along all the levees, 
it's um i was taken by that photo as well with because that that looks more like um like pacific coast highway or something yeah, you know yeah. with <laughs> with that immediate access to the river like that right and of course uh, having driven the whole pacific coast highway for the west coast book several times this brought back great memories of, yeah. of doing that and this this scenery is the most comparable to west coast scenery is up in wisconsin and minnesota before it starts to flatten out by the way so some of you see a lot of these are aerials uh i started doing aerials on the west coast book and i'd say maybe 40 percent were from the air on the east coast book it was over 50 percent because you had to get into the air so you can see these great american cities in context with the ocean and with the sea mm -hmm. it's very important to see that and then you let the imagination do the work of saying oh wow i can see how close the ocean is to new york city or or baltimore or uh, norfolk any of those how did you kind of plan out those logistics i i imagine you did a, a fair amount of driving but how did you plan out the logistics of driving well, and going up in the air and yeah yeah i have to you have to find out um ahead of time who you want to fly with and a lot of people think oh that's that must cost you a fortune how are you chartering plane i say you know i have to charter planes and people think oh that's thousands of dollars well it's not you can charter a cessna single engine cessna uh anywhere i think the cheapest i ever paid was 165 dollars an hour hmm. And the most I ever paid was $250 an hour. Wow. And it generally averages about $180, $190 an hour to fly. So it's not that expensive at all. And then the other thing I did for this, the Mississippi River book, and I don't know if ah, this is a good one to show. Um, I learned how to fly a drone, which oh. I hadn't done with the other two books. And the reason I did that was because airplanes and uh, are not allowed to fly below 400 feet. Drones are not allowed to fly above 400 feet. So if you want that zero to 400 foot um, range, you can rent a helicopter because they can do it. But helicopters are very expensive to charter. They they're going to be the cheapest. It's going to be five, six hundred dollars an hour and more. So I thought, well, you know, and I did fly a helicopter once on this trip because it was the only uh, available aircraft for the area I wanted to photograph. But I did get a drone. I had to get my FAA uh, pilot's license to fly a drone. You have, I took it pretty seriously um, because you can get in trouble uh, flying a drone if you don't if you're not licensed. Uh, I am flying it for commercial reasons for the book, even though I suppose I could have argued, no, it's fine art, it's not commercial, but you don't want to risk that. You're going to pay attorney's fees. So I got my license. You have to take a test. And it was great because then I this this shot is taken with a drone. And this is in Iowa. And apparently in Iowa, which I found out, they're very lax on drones in Iowa. Some states are tougher. You got to get permissions and so on, which I, I never did, by the way. <laughs> but uh, but I was always careful. I was thinking if I was going to take a little risk, I wanted to be sure there weren't that many people around. There were quite a few people around here. But then I heard a guy flying a drone, and I he came over and we were chatting. He said, "Oh, don't worry. Here you can fly drones. The people, the, the state police, and the." Local law enforcement, they now they let you fly drones, whatever you want to do. So this was taken with a drone, and you can see that the this is a quarry, an old abandoned quarry, that is very strange because when you get up in the air, it looks like it's holding the river back, and I guess to some extent it is. Hmm. And the other joy was when you send a drone up, you don't know quite what you're gonna see once you once it gets up there. So I was really pleased to see these barges on the river to give it some scale and and to illustrate the barge traffic so this is taken with a drone and i was up at about a little under 300 feet to take this shot and this is also taken with a drone 
This is uh, a small town called Bellevue, Iowa. And we had some friends who were living there and went to visit them. And the lock and dam was here. So I said to our friends, I said, do you mind if I put the drone up in your backyard here and let me see what's going on? And they said, oh, no, no, go ahead. Right. So this is up about 300 feet. And again, I was just so fortunate and pleased that I had a, a barge going through the lock and then another barge directly behind it. So you need to have some luck. If you take the barges out, it's, you know, it's nowhere near as good a shot. So you do need some luck with you. But what I love about this is you have this wonderful view of small town America in the Midwest with the, the commerce, the, the movement of goods up and down the, this huge, uh, this artery, major artery of uh, the United States, moving goods up and down right alongside uh, a small town. And I think the, the shot speaks a lot to that. Yeah, it's almost like it's um, it's it's kind of almost like it's two cities next to each other or, or you know, mm -hmm. there's a city right next to because it, it, it's almost um, impossible for them to interact with each other or you know, one is passing the other by on a daily basis. It's, it is really fascinating to see. And the scale, you can it gives you some idea of how huge these barges are. They. Uh, that the length of that barge right there is as long as an aircraft carrier. It's about a thousand feet. Mm. And you only have 14 people operating it. The other yeah. thing that's amazing along the river is how few people you see. There's uh, the crews that operate the, at the lock and dam. You only see two people when a barge goes through. And on the, on the uh, barge itself, you see maybe two people. Uh, so it's fascinating. Uh, and going through the farmland, like which we see here, this is right off the river, just flying alongside the river and then looking, instead of toward the river, looking away from the river, miles and miles and miles of, of farmland. And so this is the agricultural aspect of the river, which is so important. And when you're up in Minnesota, you'll have rice and uh, Corn, soybeans are the major crops that are being uh, cultivated and transported. But as we get farther south, that changes. This is Davenport, Iowa, uh, which is part of the Quad Cities. Um, and I'm shooting across the river. Now, Davenport's an interesting uh, example of how different cities approach the flooding that is quite prevalent and getting more and more prevalent along the river as time goes by. Because Davenport decided not to put barriers up because they hadn't had that much flooding. Whereas the town, which I, the name I forget at the, at the top of my head, but from where I took this photograph, that town would put up portable barriers, mm. uh, flood barriers to prevent water from coming in. And the next year, this was taken in 2018. In 2019, the river flooded quite severely, and downtown Davenport was inundated uh, because they hadn't done that. And wow. of course, it's very expensive to do this. So they're always worrying about budgets and so on. The other thing, you know, you always hear of the Midwest, and I guess you could read this into this photograph, although I hate the term. Uh, a lot of people refer to the Midwest as flyover country. And I, that's, I think that's silly. I know I've flown to Chicago, St. Louis. I don't, <laughs> I've flown to those places many times. Uh, if I'm going to California, yeah, I'm going to fly over it and, and vice versa. But what you do see here are the contrails going back right over, you know, flying right over. And they're probably yeah. going from one coast to the next. And of course, the beautiful skies. I take the skies pretty much as I get them. I rarely wait because when you're away for a few months, you're going to get all kinds of weather. Now, this is the confluence you were talking about, John, uh, before. That's the uh, Missouri River is to the left. And, of course, that's the Mississippi coming in from the right and past the oil refineries. You see a lot of refineries and um chemical plants and so on along the river. 
So the confluence, so that place where I lost my shoes and socks is that little <laughs> point uh, right at the confluence. Right now it's, uh, the tide was, uh, I guess the the river height was higher than when I was there uh, walking out there because the, it's there's a muddy point that you can walk out to, but it's underwater in this photograph, which was taken several days later. And by the way, to the uh, lower left, you'll see a river that's uh, entering the Mississippi there. And that's a park, it's the Lewis and Clark Park. And that area, that little expanse uh, of trees that you see there is where the Lewis and Clark expedition spent several weeks preparing uh, with their supplies and getting their uh, uh, getting everything together as they were getting ready to embark on their trip west. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right where it started. And you're, we're just a little bit above St. Louis here. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, so this is from the other side across the river. This is from taken from East St. Louis, but we're still looking through the arch and at the courthouse. And to the right, we have a Cargill grain uh, depot, and that um, grain gets uh, transported, as you can see, right by a conveyor, right out to the river where the barge is awaited. So no matter where you go, there's, there's industry and commerce all the way up and down the river, whether it's moving grain or growing crops. Of course, uh, I always like to say also that the Mississippi River is a microcosm of American history. And we didn't talk about it, but uh, up in Minnesota, there's a fort called Fort Snelling, where Dred Scott, who was the property of a surgeon in the, uh, in the American army in the 1940s, and this uh, surgeon was stationed at Fort Snelling and Dred Scott went with him. And that's where he met his wife, where Dred Scott met the woman he was going to marry as well. But he lived in Minnesota for a couple of years, which was considered a free state because of the Missouri Compromise. And when he got back to St. Louis, he sued for his freedom because he said he had lived in a free state for two years. And of course, that case eventually ended up in the front of the Supreme Court. And uh, that decision is uh, what many people consider a disgrace today. They said that uh, African Americans are not citizens of this country because they weren't uh, born here. They were property and couldn't be treated as citizens. They had no rights, period. And of course, that was one of the decisions and factors that went on to lead to a uh, civil war. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, by the way, this is right outside uh, St. Louis. Uh, in a cemetery called the, the Calvary Cemetery in St. Louis. And uh, we talked a little bit before about uh, flooding and what's happening on the river is there's more rainfall, certainly over the last year, 2019 was, was pretty bad for rainfall, a lot of flooding along the river. This was 2018. And even then, uh, and the time of year I was there, it was kind of unusual to see this much flooding. Um, this is uh, uh, the Merrimack River, although it looks like a big lake now, but that's a river that's a tributary of the Mississippi and it flooded. And you can see that this wooded area, which is a, a considered a recreational area and a protected park, um, is completely flooded. And I tried to walk down there. Uh, I was afraid I, there was no clear paths and I thought this is gonna turn into a disaster. I'm gonna get lost. So I went back up to the bank and I sent the drone up. And this drone, I looked about 350 feet and it's, so, it's incredible because you don't know what you're gonna see. And I go, wow, look at that. Yeah. Uh, I was so glad I had that drone with me. It was about, out of the 208 photographs in the book, there's maybe 17 or 18 that were taken with the drone. 
you know, flooding, the flooding can be so expansive and to see it from that height is, is, yes. is, is incredible. Um, here locally, we had um, a, a flood a few years back and seeing the aerial photos of it um, really puts it into context because yeah. it, that water, the water touches everything and it spreads out everywhere. Exactly. And we're, we're going to see more shots with uh, some flooding issues. Uh, in this book, I, I do a, some a pairings of images that are called diptychs. And a diptych is, are two images that are meant to be together. A triptych would be three images that are meant to be together. And once you get above three, it's, it's just called a sequence. But So here's a diptych. This is a, a series of barges going through one of the locks and dams. And here you can see there's only two people in this shot. There's a guy on bike on the left and then the guy at the head. You don't see anybody else uh, walking around. So it's it's incredible how few people you see moving these immensely large barges. Uh, this is one of the power plants, <clears throat> excuse me, on the upper Mississippi. It's a cogeneration plant meaning they use some corn as fuel to actually power the plant. <clears throat> and this is prevalent all up and down the river, this type of industry. And of course, that leads to other problems, which we'll get into when we get a little farther south. Here's a levee. <clears throat> this is uh, near Cape Girardeau uh, in Missouri. And you can see this levee broke. In actuality, that levee broke back in 2016, and it has still not been repaired. And to show you what goes on, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, did a cost-benefit analysis and decided that it was more expensive to rebuild the levee than to just let it flood and reimburse the farmers. Wow. So there you go. And then the farmers uh, that are in here, that when the river severely floods, their farmland gets inundated, they've taken to building their own makeshift levees. I don't know where that's, I know the farmers are still trying to get, uh, get those levees finished. And here's another example of highway. This is another diptych, two images meant to be together. This is Cape Girardeau. And if you look on the left, we're looking down the main street. And on the right, you see the same main street also. So one view, we're looking down toward the river, and you can see how high the river is. You see a floodgate right behind the clock that's in the street there. And then on the other side, that was taken with a helicopter, by the way. Mm. So one time I had to use a helicopter, which was great because you can get really low and hover, but expensive. <laughs> yeah. um, so here you can see the river is a pretty high stage, although not as high as it has been, uh, right up to the, uh, the flood, uh, flood wall. And the floodgate you can see on the other side both in both shots. Yeah, that flood wall I thought was really interesting. It looked, you know, it's such a pic picturesque little town and it looks like that flood wall was just, it almost looks like it was a, a, a kind of a Lego wall that was just kind of right. snapped in there. And their flood walls are all up and down the river, yeah. either levees or flood walls. They were in the pilot house of one of the uh, uh, towboats. They, it's funny they call them towboats, but they don't really tow, they push. Um, so we're right in the, the pilot house. The gentleman on the left is a, a senior chaplain with the uh, uh, Siemens Church Institute. And the gentleman on the right is the uh, pilot or the captain of the towboat. And you can see that huge expanse. Again, that's like the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. Right. Right out, right on out. And here's a shot of the towboat from the side. And then you can see the barges, the, how they're attached to the uh, towboat, these steel cables. This is in Carothersville, also Missouri. And so here's another flood gate, which is part of always part of a flood wall. 
And so you can see how high the river was on May 7th, 2011. And to the right, you can see other dates and river heights uh, in the past. So when it's funny, because when you're standing there, you're looking down 47 feet down to the river. And it's hard mm -hmm. to imagine that the water gets up that high and you'll see it would flood right down the main street were it not for those gates. And you can also see that you only got another uh, four or five, four feet to go and uh, it's not going to do you any good. Yeah, seeing uh, images of flood lines like that are, are some of the, uh, uh, they, they're, they're some of the eeriest photos, I think. Yes. Um, because it's just it's just a simple little mark or a simple little line of paint or some indicator, but what that represents in terms of you know actual mm -hmm. devastation is immense. It is, yeah. So again, it's it's like you let your imagination do the work. Yeah. Again, uh, the history of America, you know, the as a microcosm of history. So this is Memphis, Tennessee, and that's the Lorraine Hotel, where Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. And that wreath marks the exact spot. That's the balcony on which he was shot. And what was, again, kind of fortunate for me, I kind of hung around there. I mean, you never know what's What's going to happen? What's going to be that one little gesture or moment that makes a photograph stand out from all the others you might take? And so these two African American gentlemen were talking, and then he's pointing in the direction where the assassin was back in 1968. And I don't. Many of you might have seen the famous photograph taken immediately after uh, King was shot where the people on the balcony are pointing, just like he is pointing mm -hmm. in that direction. So what I liked about this photograph was how it echoed that photograph that uh, from the original date of the assassination. Beale Street, uh, and then of course you have the cultural aspects uh, all along the river. And so Beale Street is the famous, uh, known, Memphis is known for the blues, and so you see the clubs and bars all around. It's very uh, hopping at night. Um, and I'm inside one of the stores there. And it was great that uh, on this uh, mantle, uh, we had Elvis and B.B. King and Martin Luther King uh, all represented in those photographs. And that, that really added to the impact of the, the shot of Beale Street. All right, so I said in the northern part of the river, we're seeing corn and soybeans, uh, rice up way up in Minnesota. Uh, once you get down maybe 50, 75 miles north of Memphis, you start seeing cotton and cotton fields. And so here's another shot where I used the drone and pulled off alongside. The highway was just empty, and nobody, I don't think anybody passed me in a half an hour. Uh, so I felt pretty safe, you know, taking a drone, putting it up. And so glad because this turned out to be a really nice photograph uh, of a cotton field. Yeah, the Mississippi Delta is an interesting place to drive through because it yeah. is just that expanse for, for hours and hours. Yeah, and then people should have realized that the, the Mississippi Delta, all that, all that, um, rich soil filled with nutrients that's that's mississippi river mud that all that right. is being planted in and it's mud that had been deposited over millennia practically uh i had actually read that the gulf of mexico i and i i, I read it once but i haven't seen it so i'm just going to throw this out if somebody else wants to research it but i mexico several i don't know how many millions of years ago actually came up to St. Start, ended at St. Louis. That's how far up the Gulf was. And that the river filled it all in over millions of years of sediment. And so you get all that mm -hmm. nutrient-rich mud 
uh, that's just been built up. So the river literally built the land from St. Louis south to a, to a large degree. Now this is again going along our history uh, theme. The paddle wheel steamboats uh, that plied the river back in the 1800s and early 1900s. And there are still uh, cruise lines. So this is American Cruise Line. And this is the largest paddle wheeler that's still operating on the river. And we're in Vicksburg uh, at this point, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, where the famous uh, Civil War battle took place. Of course, the Mississippi River was crucial. Whoever controlled the Mississippi River really was had a leg up to win the war. And uh, so that battle was in 1863. And here's the battlefield itself. Now, it's interesting, uh, of course, this is over 100, what are we talking about, 175 years ago now. This is the Illinois State Memorial that looks out over the battlefield. And I see a lot of trees out there now. Back uh, when the battle took place, there were no trees there. It was pretty barren because it's strange when you drive around the battlefield, you see Howard's is pointed at a tree and you go, well, what? and I said, this was the line of such and such regiment or whatever. And you say, well, what, why is it pointing at a tree? Yeah. Well, because this, this was all barren before. And so the only place that's still barren is right here. And here we are on the river. I'm on a, a, a boat that's operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. And it's another uh, towboat goes by with barges. And that looks like coal. And of course, there's the Indian culture uh, all up and down the river. And that's somewhat of a tragic story as well, because uh, in the 1830s, of course, uh, once uh, the government realized that uh, the soil uh, in the Delta was rich for growing crops, uh, they wanted to acquire all the land. So they, uh, Andrew Jackson uh, wrote a, um, a law that the uh, Native, all Native Americans had to be west of the Mississippi River by a certain date. And so it became known as the Trail of Tears, as tribe after tribe had to pick up and move from their homeland, across the river into unknown territory for them. Uh, before all that happened, and I was completely naive about some of the Native American culture. This is an, a mound. This is the Winterville Mounds in Mississippi. And... Uh, they were considered man building societies. And a lot of these mounds, as you can see the people in the foreground, that's about 300 feet tall. And they were had ceremonial uses usually. Some were burial mounds, like an effigy mounds, National Park up in mm -hmm. uh, Minnesota, those were burial mounds. These were more ceremonial mounds. And there are mounds all up and down the river. Um, outside of St. Louis, there's the Wachovia mounds. So there was a rich, rich uh, culture in Native American history all along the river. Yeah, I always find mounds so uh, intriguing because they, you know, they look so natural, but I mean, at the same time, you know, they're intentional, you know, they were put there for a purpose, a right. specific idea. Um, and so, yeah, it is, it is just something interesting to sort of contemplate. Yeah, they're, they're fascinating. And, and when we were there, uh, they were having a Native American festival, uh, which was going on here. And so there was there were dances going on, different uh, tribes that had come. This particular dance troupe was actually had come in from Oklahoma. And you can see the mound in the background uh, mm -hmm. with that man standing up and the mound directly behind him. And they had just done an eagle dance, actually, speaking of, uh, you know, the eagles um, and the, the great role they play in American history and Native American history. So here are the levees. Uh, levees start south of St. Louis. There are some levees, a little, there's a levee in Galena, Illinois, where General Grant uh, 
lived after the presidency. Um, they're earthen levees, uh, but then uh, there's about 1,400 miles of levees uh, total along the river. And the, of course, they're meant to prevent flooding, but in many ways they exacerbate flooding because the river, now there's nowhere for the sediment to go as all that sediment that comes down from all the tributaries and into the river, you know, that's why it's so muddy. And so what happens is the sediment settles at the bottom of the river and that raises the height of the river and it just feeds upon itself. So when there were floodplains, the river would, you know, go out into the floodplains, the sediment would settle, create the soil, and it was all very natural. So to solve a problem, we create more problems. <laughs> As we do. Yes, we have a knack <laughs> for doing that. And as, speaking of problems, here's uh, these are the Windsor ruins in uh, Mississippi. And this is what's left of a plantation that was built in 1860. Um, again, a cotton plantation. And during the Civil War, it uh, gets, got through the war unscathed. that had been occupied by both Union and Confederate troops. And in fact, Mark Twain had spent some time there at one point. So it survived the war. And then I think in 1865 or six, soon after, uh, they're having a party and someone got careless with a cigarette or a flame of some sort. And uh, the uh, plantation or the, the main house burned to the ground. And the only thing left standing were these Corinthian columns, which are still there. It's so strange to drive in on that. And this was taken with the drone. Now you see, I'm I'm only, the drone, drone was great because I only wanted to get up about 20 feet. So it's like having, it's like bringing a ladder with you. Well, I can't get up 20 feet, so I'll put the drone up 20 feet. It's a lot more portable than a ladder, that's for sure. It is, it is and much lighter. <laughs> <laughs> and here's what something you might be familiar, familiar with. This is the old river control structure. And I guess, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, John, are you aware of what this does? Yeah, it diverts, um, diverts the flow of the Mississippi right. out into, towards the Chafalaya, yeah? Correct. And it, it diverts about 30% of the flow of the Mississippi uh, to the Atchafalaya and the river there. And so what's going on here is that the river really wants to move west. It wants to move into the Atchafalaya. And of course, the Army Corps of Engineers cannot allow that to happen because of all the refineries and chemical plants and all the industry that you called about chemical, uh, was it Cancer Alley? Cancer Alley, yeah. Cancer Alley. Yeah, because all that industry from here on down to New Orleans, if the river moved, well, goodbye. You know, the 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 damage to our economy and even world economy would be quite substantial. Um so what you're looking at in the foreground is the is a hydroelectric dam. And in the middle is a low sill structure, or a, a yeah, low sill structure, which is allowed. If the river gets too high, they can open that and allow water to flood the area. And then you see the actual diversion canal is next. Uh, and then to the right, up at the top, is the uh, Old River Control structure, and that part of the river is where the most of the thirty percent is diverted out into um, the Atchafalaya. Mm -hmm. And this, back in 2019, there was great concern uh, when they were opening a lot of these uh, spillways that uh, the river could jump. Uh, it didn't. But as one professor at uh, Louisiana, I think it was at Louisiana State University said, uh, we're one good flood away from the river jumping. 
Yeah, yeah. There was a there was a lot of uh, tension last year uh, about that. My um, my wife's family has a camp on Old River, and it typically stays flooded um, for a few months out of the year, especially right. in the spring. You know, when the snow melt is uh, coming through from the north. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, typically uh, by summer, you know, um, that all um, goes back down and they can enjoy the camp. But I, I don't, I think last year, I don't, I don't think they made it. Um, I think the water didn't go down until after summer was over with. Yeah. It was, um, it was, it was really high for a really long time. It was pretty bad. And, you know, um, these 500 year storms that they always talk about, they happen about every two or three years now. Yeah. And so all you need is a storm like, uh, New York has gotten hit by hurricanes before New York City, but it's a 400 year event, they say. But when Sandy hit, it actually had combined with another storm and it created this. It was only a category one hurricane only, but it was huge. It covered the whole East Coast practically and it stayed. And the storm surges were absolutely horrific. So if you get an event like that, and it's not a matter, it's just a matter of when is that going to happen? When sure. are you going to get a storm? So you already had, and you dodged a bullet, I guess, with those two hurricanes that came up into Louisiana out of the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And one went a little, they didn't follow quite the course, fortunately, that they had originally thought. Because in the beginning, I think they were both heading right for New Orleans. Well, if that were to happen, let's say it would, that did happen. You had a one-two punch, boom, boom, and they linger like it did over uh, Houston a few years ago. That storm just stayed there, and they carry so much more water now and more rain. You got an event like that here, and that that could do it. That could break the you – know, send the river over to the west. It's been wanting to do that, you know, because water seeks its shortest right. downhill route. Right, right. And uh, this is the Evergreen Plantation in Louisiana, which is the only plantation that has uh, the original intact slave cabins, which is what we're looking at here. Here, another diptych and this alley of oak trees, um, which are old enough that they were you know, a witness to slavery. That's going back 170 years or so. Right. Uh, so the slave cabins are right here, all intact, right down this road. And here's the uh, other people have referred to this area of the river from Baton Rouge down, down to New Orleans as the American Ruhr, R-U-H-R, like the German, mm -hmm. the Ruhr in Germany is the river where all the industry is. So they call this the American Ruhr. Uh, so again, so imagine if all this went high and dry, uh, the, the uh, economic consequences would be very severe. Yeah, it would be very drastic. So here I'm flying uh, early evening, a great full moon out. Uh, it was really hazy, as you, as you can see. But, you know, the trickery in photography today in Photoshop, you can actually cut through haze in the Photoshop program itself is pretty incredible. Hmm. Like here, this is much more hazy uh, when you're up in the air than it, I was able to uh, get it uh, on shooting digitally. Uh, by the way, I, this is all digital. Both East Coast and uh, uh, Mississippi River were all shot digitally. West Coast was actually about 90% of it was shot on film because when I started that book, Digital wasn't up to snuff yet. It was, uh, I started shooting that book in the late 90s and I finished it in 2010. Um, by about 2008, it got, it was getting pretty good. And I did shoot the Aleutian Islands digitally, but yeah. everything else was on film. So yeah, I always have to keep up with everything. <laughs> yeah. moving. So here we are just south of New Orleans now in Plaquemine Parish which got hit very hard, as you know, with the Hurricane Katrina. And at this point, right. once, 
from Baton Rouge down, you don't you won't see towboats anymore and barges. There, all the all the commodities get transferred to cargo ships, and they go out, you know, all over the world, and they head out onto the Gulf of Mexico. And here we have a cargo ship coming, coming into the river. This is the the bird's foot, as it's called. Right as the river breaks into three bodies of water as it empties into the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And this was great. I mean, I'm in an air. I'm in a Cessna. You know, I'm always timing these things for. We take off about two hours before sunset or thereabouts, and so that I know I'm going to be up in the air as the sun is setting. And then this is out. We're looking back now. That's the main uh, tributary, or it's not. Well, not tributary. It's the main mouth of the Mississippi as it empties into the Gulf of Mexico. And then I would also add, I don't know, and John, if you know this, uh, there's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that's approximately the size of the state of Rhode Island. So as the river empties into the Gulf, it's carrying all the pesticides and fertilizer from the agricultural fields all the, all the way up to Minnesota also. All of that is being washed down the river. And it ends up in, in the end going into the Gulf of Mexico. And it, it cuts off so much oxygen that there's an area the size of Rhode Island where nothing grows. There's no fish, no plant life. It's just a complete dead zone. And of yeah. course, Louisiana is, is, has a whole commission on <clears throat> controlling coastal erosion. And uh, they're losing uh, the, the figure that you always hear bandied about is they're losing a football field of wetlands every hour. I think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that obviously gets a lot of attention down our way. And yeah, every yeah. year the the media coverage of the 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 Gulf dead zone, um, they're always comparing it to the year before, and it's always bigger. Mm -hmm. Right. And last year. Um, in Lake Pontchartrain, they had to. Um, they ended up keeping the Bonacary Spillway open um, for. I think they opened it twice, and I think it was open for a period of four, four and a half months total um, mm -hmm. in the spring, which is just unprecedented. And sure. um, so the Mississippi was being diverted into Lake Pontchartrain, and I make frequent trips down to New Orleans, and it's. Um, it's strange to see because it, it changes the color of mm -hmm. the lake and Lake Poncha train is so huge. Um, and yeah, all of the, all of the, the nasty, nasty stuff that's being swept away. Um, you know, um, I remember stories last year about like dolphin populations that were mm -hmm. being affected and uh, dolphin die offs and things like that. And the fisheries um, that were being affected. And so, yeah, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, you know, a lot of that was because of the fresh water. Yeah, the, the river water is all fresh, and it's going into the salt water. And those animals that and fish, you know, a saltwater fish cannot survive in fresh water, and vice versa. Yeah. So that's what was happening. The dolphins, their skins, were, skin was getting uh, diseased, and you know right. they just couldn't survive. Well, you know, once their skin gets to, to uh, infected and corrupted it's uh, you know they're not going to live too long so yeah it was awful right so uh so the mississippi is a uh, it's kind of a paradoxical uh journey because there's so much that the country needs to survive you know there's wonderful people the, the industry that goes on is is terrific um you know the ingenuity of the locks and dams and all these, but they're they're aging. They're most of them are, are only designed to uh, uh, survive for about fifty years, and they're well past that. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the 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 uh, as Simon Winchester points out, it's it's a manufactured river now, almost almost the entirety of it, and right. it's and it's a canal. Uh, so this it's not it's not natural. There's very little natural about the Mississippi River anymore. 
So what do you do about it? Well, that's <laughs> that's the conundrum. That's the conundrum because it's it's very difficult, as I think most of us know, when there's an economic interest, it's very difficult to initiate change because it's so much, so many people get affected. So where it's all going to go, I think Mother Nature, as I said in my book, and I wrote an essay at the end, I said, uh, Mother Nature and Father Time are going to solve this problem no matter what we do. And eventually it will get resolved. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I completely agree, especially with, you know, the, the change in weather patterns and the change in the way that we have to approach things. Um, you know, I think everything was kind of done in um, sort of... Um, ad hoc sort of um, reactionary way, you know, uh, with building all the different infrastructure that's up and down the river, but with yeah. things actively changing, I think there's going to have to be a more proactive approach that, um, you know, I, I don't think people being what people are, I don't think we're going to sit down and just figure it out. I think it's unfortunately going to take, you know, yeah. being pounded by rains and floods yeah for us to force force ourselves to reckon with it. That's right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I do see Louisiana is, but it's what they're doing in the Jersey Shore here. You know, they keep bringing sand in and dredging and, you know, that's all well and good up, up to a point, but at some point it just, you can't dredge enough sand in to, right. to alleviate the situation. And there's just so much wetland loss and then it, feeds on itself. There's less wetland to protect when the other when you get these storm surges and the ocean wants to come in. Well the wetlands used to protect from those storm surges. So when you lose it, the storm surges go in even farther. And and that eliminates more wetlands. So you get this once you get into that cycle, it's it's very hard to break it. Right. Yeah, here in Livingston Parish, we have um, at the southern tip of our parish, we have Lake Marpal, which is right next to Lake Pontchartrain. And so um, even though we're, um, you know, even though we're a good 80 miles from the Gulf Coast, we're still considered a coastal community mm -hmm. um, because we still, uh, the southern part of the parish still sees those effects that you're talking about um, from storm surge and um uh, tidal effects and things like that. Right. Yeah. Well, was that your uh, last slide that you had that there? Last slide. We're at the end of the river. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> well, good deal. Well, we had a couple of questions uh, sure. that came in, and I jotted down a couple of notes for myself as well. Um, we had a couple of folks that were curious uh, to hear you talk a little bit about the equipment that you use, um, some of the some of your various gear, and also um, editing. Um, how much, just kind of your general editing philosophy, how much um, uh, how, how much you try to put in and how much you try to avoid and that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. Um, equipment, and I'm, I'm a minimalist uh, <coughs> with equipment. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So what's been nice about the digital age and the way lenses have developed is back in the old days, and I'm old enough that, before zoom lenses got to be really good. We had to, I had to carry like 10 different prime lenses and you know two or three camera bags. It was pretty heavy. But oh boy, and by the late 90s, early 2000s, the lenses started to get really good, the zoom lenses. So I was able to, I'm only able to carry three lenses now. I carry a wide angle zoom. Now I, I shoot with a full frame Canon Mark IV uh, digital camera. It's full frame, meaning that the frames, the sensor size is equivalent to a 35 millimeter traditional uh, frame. So with that in mind, I, I have a wide angle zoom that goes from about 17 millimeters to 40 millimeters. Then I have a, a normal zoom that goes from about 70 to... 135 and then i have a telephoto zoom that goes from 200 to 400 and then i have and i don't take this with me too often but i have a really long telephoto it's very heavy so i i might have it in my trunk but i don't cart it out with me all the time mm -hmm. it goes from 150 to 600 
millimeters. And the few times I need to shoot wildlife, uh, which are in the book, um, I'd probably be using that lens. So that's the lens selection. Uh, and again, the Canon uh, Mark IV, which is a 31 megapixel camera. So I can make, if I want to make prints, which I want to do for exhibitions and mm -hmm. uh, when uh, if museums acquire prints for a collection, I can go as big as uh, probably 26 by 20, if even bigger, uh, with that size of a of a um, resolution size for the the Mark IV. Uh, as far as uh, what was the other question about editing? Editing, editing. Yeah. All right, so. I sh because I'm in the air for probably 50, 60 percent of these images. When you're in the air, you have to shoot a lot because, as as, as obvious, you can't stand still. You can't put the camera on a tripod and and frame the shot up and say, "Oh, let me move a little here." So you got to shoot pretty quickly. You have to be able to anticipate. Now, because I've done it so much, I've gotten pretty damn good at even paying attention to what I'm shooting. I can kind of see what's coming. I know how long it's going to take to get there. I have an idea of what I'm looking for in my mind. Is it farmland? Am I looking at a lock and dam? Uh, what is it I, I'm specifically trying to get in this one, one or two mile stretch? So let's say I take a hundred shots in 15 minutes, maybe more, maybe 200 shots. Well, now I got to go back and edit that. But that actually is quite simple to do because once you get everything in front of you, I, you can pick out the one shot out of the hundred that you might have taken on that strip very quickly. Well, that's no good. I missed this. The camera was off here. I wish I got the wing in this shot. You know, whatever's going on. So the editing can can happen pretty quickly. Uh, I'm a pretty fast editor. So for this for this book, uh, I'm just pulling a number. I, let's, I probably took three thousand exposures, and people go, "Wow, that's a well." I can edit that 3,000 down to 300 pretty quickly, uh, you know, maybe in a week or so. Sure. It's it's getting that 300 or 400 down to the 200 that are going to be in the book. That's tough, but you want it to be tough. You want it to be tough as hell because. Yeah. If it's not tough, you just go, well, that's terrible. And you get down to 200 in no time. Well, then you you probably had a lot of weak images. So you want to end up with 400 really strong images and then have a hell of a time. That's So it's the final edit for the book that's the toughest. And then once I do, but before I do that, I make proof prints. I have maybe those 400 images. I'll make proof prints. I also, uh, it might interest a, a lot of you to know that I'm shooting in color. So I shoot color, mm -hmm. then I convert to black and white, and then I add toning, you know, through Photoshop. You'll notice that most of the shots are they vary in their warmth. But some are a little more yellow than others. Some are a little cooler. So that back and forth, uh, and that's an homage to the great landscape photographers in American history that that I, I feel they, they would be so envious of how we can <laughs> shoot today because the photographers that documented the West back in after the Civil War, they had to carry these wagons of glass plates that are, you know, 20 by 24 inches. That's the size of the film. And these big, huge cameras with bellows and and there were no roads, you know, to get to these places, camp out. It was just to get uh, one or two images was a Herculean task. I can, you know, so I'm in an airplane. I can take 100 shots in 15 minutes. They, they would be astounded, but they would do. I mean, they would love it. Um, yeah, they'd be at least a little jealous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm 
so that, but if you look at the prints back then, they're all sepias and different shades of brown and some are reddish, some are yellowish. And I love that look. And I thought, and I, the, one of the reasons I love it is because it, it keeps your interest going. You know, well, this is an interesting color. And so I'll tone them all to different, no, um, no two prints uh, except in the diptychs are toned the same way. And I guess then the next one, I'm going to ask the questions that people might want to ask. Well, how do you decide what to tone? You know, do you want to go a little brown, a little yellow? What is that? Where, where does that come from? Well, that's a lot harder to explain. It's it's kind of based on my emotional remembrance of the scene at the time. Mm. And also, uh, uh, generally, a winter scene is going to be a little cooler than a summer scene. But even that's a gross, that's a generality. Sometimes I reverse it. It's more a feeling, it's more a sense, and it's a memory of what I did before. Um, it might be a remembrance of a photograph from the history of photography that I might try to have it look like that. So every photograph is, a, is toned a little bit different. Yeah, when I, when I, whenever I see um, the different tones throughout your book, I, I think a lot of the, the temperature um, and I also, uh, right. humidity comes to mind, um, yeah. you know, especially in our area down here, um, you know, um, looking out at the South Louisiana river, um, mm -hmm. you, you want to witness that humidity <laughs> cause you can't miss it. <laughs> well, that's where the emotional thing comes in. Yeah. I do have a sense of what, it, what I was feeling and what it was like when I was there. So, you know, colors are very expressive. They have a great deal of emotional content and it's not everyone's gonna pick, I mean, you're not in my skin, you know, you're not in my brain. Right. So different color like red may mean something to somebody else and a little bit different meaning than, than another person. But in general, um, I think they, they're very evocative of an, of an emotional state. Right. That's what I try to do. Well, um, had a couple of other questions that were touching on uh, the logistics of the trip. Sort of, right. how long did it take? How did you how did you break up the different sections? Um, how many trips did you have to take, and that sort of thing? Okay. Uh, well, this is another advantage of the modern age because, uh, unlike West Coast, <clears throat> before Google Earth was in existence. I think Google Earth came in maybe toward the end when I was doing that book. But I could travel this river on Google Earth without leaving, you know, my house, just looking at my laptop. I said, well, let me look, go right down this river. <clears throat> and I can take my time. And then I read, as I said, I read quite a few books. I did a lot of research online as well to try to pick out the places that I at least thought I should uh, want to get to. And then I could even check them out on Google Earth. You can come right down and, and get a view of what a photograph might look like. So that was a big help. And that saves, as you can imagine, again, going back to these the, the photographers that went out in the wagons, they had no idea what they were gonna, what was coming up around the bend. There was no planning, so to speak, except bringing their equipment. So I could at least, I could plan out the map before I, as I get, before I set out, uh, set foot out of the house. Um, the first trip was a winter trip uh, up to uh, the source. I wanted to get the source, Lake Itasca, uh frozen over. I wanted to do that because the other books had started in ice and snow, and I wanted to keep that theme going through. So that was the first trip. I was away about a week, um, came back, edited. Then I knew um, that I was learning to fly the drone, got my license and all that stuff. And then I was put in touch with uh, some people of the Mississippi River Commission and the Army Corps of Engineers. And they arranged for me to, to go out in August of 2018 to ride on the Mississippi River Commission's uh, low water inspection tour. Hmm. And so that I was out for a week uh, doing that. And 
I didn't stay on the boat. I was it was a it was day cruising for me, and then I'd have to drive. That someone would take me back to my car, and I was you go back and drive down to pick up the the boat again the next day, and then they drop you off and go back. A lot of back and forth. But I also did a lot of shooting on my own, like I did the Vicksburg battlefield when I was on that trip. So that was I got a lot of good images there. Got the meeting of the Mississippi River Commission, which is in the book. Then the main part of the trip uh, where I did the most of the photography was in uh, September and October of 2018. And my wife and I, my wife accompanied me on the road trip. She didn't accompany me on the, the other side trips. But so we drove from Philly out to uh, uh, Dubuque, Iowa. That's where we started. And then drove up uh, back to Minnesota, back up to the source in the in the fall, and then wound our way down to St. Louis over a three week period. And then we went came home, go all the way back to Philly, because I didn't want to do the whole river at once and not go home and see what I had. I wanted to guys, so I got half the river covered. Let me see what I have. Let me edit it. Let me be sure I'm happy with it. Let me be sure I'm gonna. So we came home for two weeks, did all the editing, and I was very happy with it. And so that that's actually a big burden off. Well, now I can go back and devote my full attention to the lower half of the river. Mm-hmm. So we drove back out to St. Louis, picked up where we left off, and the, the next three weeks uh, headed all the way down to. I mean, we, we drove as far as uh, the end of the road in Louisiana and ends in Venice, a little bit south of Venice in Louisiana, and and then drove uh, diagonally back to Philadelphia through Louisiana and Alabama and up back to Philly. So it was a two-day trip to drive back home. Mm-hmm. So that was the amount. And then I went back. When I, I wanted to get that eagle shot. So I made arrangements with the National Eagle Center to go back in the winter, in December of 2018, and they made arrangements for me to photograph Angel, and I got some other good shots. So I was only there two or three days, and my God, they gave me a Dodge Charger. I rented a car (laughs) in snow and ice. I'm in this behemoth, powerful, rear-wheel drive (laughs) Dodge Charger. But fortunately, I, I didn't run off the road or anything. But Well, at least you looked cool. I did look cool. The beautiful gray, uh, battleship gray, really nice looking in that car. Um, so that was it. That was that was the amount. So, uh, I, but Google Earth, I mean, it's say I can't imagine without Google Earth and being able to uh, travel the river ahead of time. That's, that's a huge advantage. Yeah, I think I might actually go check that out because I'll tell you, just listening to you talk about traveling has got me uh, feeling some ants in my pants a little bit, <laughs> especially especially since I haven't been anywhere in eight months. <laughs> yeah, know the feeling, I know. Yeah. Well, uh, last question I had for you, um, something I'm curious about. You mentioned it a couple of times. I'm curious, uh, what were the books that you read sort of in preparation? Did you focus mostly on sort of the the geology and geography or was it more cultural? Yeah, yeah, I don't think there are books that anyone would necessarily, although there was a book that was kind of helpful. Uh, There's a a photography book called The Mississippi River in 1953. And it was a documentary filmmaker who set out to do it, as as, uh, you might imagine, a documentary film on the river but it never materialized. But all all along the way, he took snapshots, like with a brownie camera back in the day. And that's actually a pretty fascinating book, but it was a little, you know, 1953 to to 2018 when I was shooting was, was quite a difference. But it was a nice frame of reference and to see what people had done in the past. But most of the books were, <clears throat> there was one book that was just called Mississippi River, and this author, who's in, forgive me, I mean I don't remember the authors at this point, but it was a 
almost a mile by mile trip down the not almost it was a mile by mile trip down the river where they would tell you of specific sites like think for example and it's not in the book which was kind of disappointing but there was there's a sign in uh, i think it was in near dallas city missouri where if you drive <clears throat> toward the river there's a, a sign that says what was it was to say uh end of road <laughs> the river's right in front of you but they feel it necessary to tell you that it's the end of the road and this guy in the book found thought that was pretty humorous and so i said well i gotta go photograph that which i did but we decided uh i would have loved to put it in the book my my uh, publisher editor uh and i we don't argue too much i mean if he uh if i really want an image in if i really wanted it in he'd have put it in but I thought, well, you know, I'll defer. Um, so that was one book. Uh, like, I, no, I didn't read Mark Twain. Um, I had read it many years ago, of course. But um, they were mainly more travel log books that I read right. to see about the sites where I wanted to go and so on. Yeah. And there were at least six or seven of those. And uh, an internet research as well, just looking right. up articles and seeing what interested people and so on and so. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look yeah. up some of those so that I could uh, merchandise them with your book throughout the Christmas season. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, very cool. Well, um, I thank you so much for joining us tonight. I thank you so much for ta talking to us about your book and um, taking us literally from uh, north to south down the Mississippi north. River. Yeah, I, I would just add um, in closing, you know, I don't, there's so few people I think that would actually think to drive the length of the Mississippi River north to south. And I've been telling all my friends, you know, you know, obviously I'm, we did it because it was a photographic uh, excursion, it was a trip we wanted to document and talk about America, you know, and, and represent the Midwest. But I said, it was a complete joy. I yeah. mean, we had a ball. We had a great time, you know, met great people, great food, uh, great sights, learned a ton. I mean, you can't imagine how much you learn. And you got that great river road either side. I mean, you can do it. I, I've been telling people, if you want to have a fun, really different kind of journey drive the mississippi river north don't just cross it <laughs> right because you're going out west you know and cross at one time and say you know five minutes you, if that you see the river now nah, that's so anyway I, I would end on that note that it's it's really a, a special place to drive and my, my dad has actually always had a fantasy of um boating down the mississippi river uh, mm -hmm. its entire length. So um, he's probably going to get a copy of your book for Christmas. <laughs> okay. <Very interesting. laughs> well, good deal. Well, David, thank you again. Right. I, I appreciate thank you, John. it. I really Thanks. appreciate the opportunity. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye.